happened on Wednesday the 29th of August 1984 at the British Columbian Camp. 23rd study, right? Yeah. Now, in our last session together, we talked about uh, the crisis developing as some folk in Australia challenged the organisational structure which they themselves had once stood. And in time, it was decided... I, I, it was decided the meeting should be held in which the two positions would be presented to the believers, not for their vote, but for them to take a stand the one way or the other. Now, Charlie Morgan did accuse us of taking a vote at that meeting. <coughs> There's a great di dif difference between taking a vote and standing for a principle. And the principle, of course, was the question of whether we would be organised in one way or the other. And um, he... Um, accuse us of taking a vote when in fact we stood for the principle of uh, God's truth versus the error which he was trying to push upon us. Well, things before the meeting took place, uh, I talked to Charlie quite extensively and tried to reason with him. He was quite confirmed in his position. I said, well, we can't operate under these conditions. We just simply have to uh, uh, call the believers together as many as possible in Australia and let the two positions be laid out and let them choose for themselves which, which way they want to operate, which way they believe they should operate. And he agreed to that and looked very, very confident uh, and happy about the plan. So the word was spread around and uh, believers began to assemble from quite distant locations, I say distant up to two or three hundred miles away, and uh, probably all together was about 50 people were able to come together at Palmer's for this discussion. And I said to Charlie, now I said, you're the challenger, you're the one who's um, putting forward a proposition for change, so therefore I said, you should speak first. But he wouldn't do that. He said, no, he said, you speak first. And I said, very well, if you insist, I shall, although it wasn't quite proper to do so. And as I said in the last study, I went to that meeting quite convinced that I would uh, see the... Uh, the Lord's way put down and the other way upheld. I felt that the witness of history was too strong to suggest that people would, would, would do otherwise. But I was still determined not to go in there fighting, to go in there resting in God's grace and to do His will His way. So I stood up and presented the principles of divine order and organisation from A.T. Jones, the Spirit of Prophecy in the Bible, and uh, I gave two presentations in the morning and two more in the afternoon. And when I'd finished, I said, now, that's all I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say any more. You'll now listen to what the other side has to say. When, when you've heard that, you make up your own minds. There'll be no great long haggling or discussion about the matter. And to my amazement, they came back with one voice and said, we don't want to hear the other side. We've heard enough. Our minds are made up. Amen. <laughs> and I was incredulous. Really, I was incredulous. And it, does, it, it, does, it did demonstrate to me the awesome power of letting God be the problem solver and not trying to fight for God's cause in any sense of the word at all. Well, I said, now come, you have to be fair and give these folk a hearing. I said, uh, it's not fair just to brush them off without uh, the opportunity to, to, to tell what they want to tell. Well, very reluctantly, they, they decided in the end to give them a hearing. And then... Charlie, apparently seeing how lost the cause was, the cause wasn't very disposed to say anything at all. And uh, in the end, um, he did give a, a fairly, what I thought was a fairly weak presentation, a kind of a defeated uh, presentation. And, um, and so the, the thing came to its end and uh, he and five, four people with him left the church permanently. We've never seen them back in the organisation since. And that was the end of the story so far as Palmer's was concerned. Now, we, we then took pains to inform the believers around the world of what had happened at Palmer's and we still have the master tapes down there of the meetings if you ever want to hear them. They're the same arguments, of course, in, in, in um, God's Sabbath rest and what you've heard this morning, but you're welcome to hear the whole presentation if you want to send for them. And all around the world, in the coming camping, I laid out these principles and the believers were very happy to accept them. And that uh, settled forever, the, well I hope forever, the organisational question so far as this movement is concerned. And as I said before, it was, it, it, it was as if heaven had been waiting for this thing to be uh, settled because 
immediately after this we began to see the work really progressing many more believers came in new centers were opened up new countries opened up more camp meetings began to be convened and as well great truths we had not previously seen also came to light as um, time passed and I believe that our greatest messages are found in the Sabbath rest God's character uh, true maker mystery work the Philadelphian church the seven angels and all of those have come to us subsequent to that victory gained back there in Palmer's in 1974 or was it 1975 and from that time on we've had no further difficulty with the organizational question now let me see if I remember now what other main events I should mention the, the there have been no ep epochal events since that point of time except perhaps the death of Wolfgang Meyer in Germany which uh, alerted me made me aware that um, organizational influences they are moving in the wrong direction and that that sacrifice corrected that um, but it's been mainly a history now of the work advancing in every part of the world field it's opened up marvelously here in Canada over the past uh, two years and it's advancing strongly in, in, in the United States of America the German camp is the biggest ever that we held just a few days ago and the spiritual tone and power in the mystery course is, is increasing continually and as I look back over the years I can only ask the question what has God wrought and I'm rejoicing to see that unlike previous movements before us we have come out as far as I can see on the right side of every controversy no doubt of course as time goes by there are going to be adjustments necessary to um, really finally confirm us in the right direction and weed out little inconsistency which we haven't seen yet but we are moving in the right direction and more and more, more, and more of God's power is coming amongst us and that's very gratifying indeed now I'd like to close this presentation of um, the prophecies that deal with the rise of this movement and the history which confirms the fulfillment of those prophecies by looking at the very fine statement on page 123 and 124 of the book Early Writings and this chapter is called False Shepherds I shall take the entire chapter because I believe every word of it is significant at the present moment it has an application initially of course to events shortly after 1844 but inasmuch as we recognize that um, that history is being repeated in the parable of the ten virgins the same points are very much applicable to us at the present time I start to read now from page 123 I have been shown that the false shepherds were drunk but not with wine they staggered but not with strong drink the truth of God is sealed up to them they cannot read it when they're interrogated as to what the seventh day Sabbath is whether or not it is the true Sabbath of the Bible they, they, they lead the mind to fables I saw that these prophets were like the foxes of the desert they have not gone up into the gaps they have not made up the hedge which the Lord that the people of God may stand in the battle in the day of the Lord when the minds of any get stirred up and they begin to inquire of these false shepherds about the truth they take the easiest and best manner to effect their object and quiet the minds of the inquiring ones even changing their own position to do it the light has shone on many of these shepherds but they found but they would not acknowledge it and have changed their position a number of times to evade the truth and get away from the conclusions they must come to if they continue in their former position the power of truth to up their foundation but instead of yielding to it they would get up another platform that they were not satisfied with themselves now the Sabbath was the great issue at this point of time when these words were first written it is not uh, today well it is today the issue again really because uh, the question is are we going to follow man's way which is Sunday keeping or God's ways of course which is true Sabbath keeping and the whole Sabbath rest message highlights the nature of this issue so whereas back there it was mainly a contention over which day of the week was a true Sabbath and how it should be kept today of course it goes much deeper than that uh, because advancing light has sharpened the controversy and uh, taken it down to depths not plunged into before and it is true that uh, today the false shepherds do follow the same procedures and they do take up varying positions in order to counteract the truth if they possibly can I, I read on now 
I saw that many of these shepherds had denied the past teachings of God. They had denied and rejected the glorious truth which they once zealously advocated and had covered themselves with mesmerism and all kinds of delusions. Now I remember very, very distinctly a Seventh-day Adventist minister actually related to me, incidentally, through, through my marriage, who had spent most of his life in the mission field, who had gone as a successful student through Longburn Missionary College in New Zealand many, many years ago now, and who had been taught all the great Adventist fundamentals, the sanctuary, the state of the dead, the nature of Christ and so forth, and who firmly believed that Jesus Christ came in the same fallen sinful flesh and blood as we have until the General Conference decreed otherwise. And his loyalty to the General Conference was so great that he changed his position purely on the basis of what they said initially. Of course, afterwards he studied in, in, in the light of their interpretation and then confirmed his support of their particular position. And this is not an isolated case. I've been perfectly amazed to find that, uh, generally speaking, the direction of the General Conference de determines the thinking of the ministry right down the line. And so positions have been changed and truths have been given up and there's no question about the fact that even uh, Laodicean Adventism today have denied and rejected many truths that they once stood for. I go a little further. I saw that they were drunken with error and were leading on their flock to death. Many of the opposers of God's truth devised mischief in their heads upon their beds and in the day they carry out their wicked devices to put down the truth and to get something new to interest the people and divert their minds from the precious all-important truth. Passing a little further now, it talks about the plagues cutting down these um, false shepherds. We come now to the main paragraph in the chapter which I'd like to spend most time upon. And here is a paragraph which I believe is one that we can use as a test, as a means of determining where the true movement of God is at the present time. And the statement says, the different parties of professed Advent believers have each a little truth. Which means, of course, that if you're trying to decide from the point of view that... Uh, we have one church with all the truth and all the rest of it on the error, you'll never find what you're looking for because even the worst church upon the earth has some truth. Even the Roman Catholic Church teaches some truth. In fact, I have a Roman Catholic Catechism in my library at home and I can read that Roman Catholic Catechism and be astonished that there are some expressions of truth which are therein. Clear, unadulterated truth because it's mixed up with so much error that uh, it in turn becomes error itself. But let's face the fact that the different parties of professed Advent believers have each a little truth, but God has given all these truths to his children who are being prepared for the day of God. Now, here are two classifications of individuals. One, the different parties of professed Advent believers. The other, God's children who are being prepared for the day of God. Now what's the difference between these two groups so far? The difference is this, that group A has one truth, group B is a different truth, group C is another truth again, group D has still another truth yet, and so each of them has a different truth amongst themselves, and so only a little truth in each case. And that's all the professed Advent believers, but there's one group named as God's children who have been prepared for the day of God, who has collectively all the truths the others have individually. Now that's sufficient of itself, of course, to determine who are the true people of God. Now, <clears throat> we read the next sentence. He has also given them truths that none of these parties know, neither will they understand. Now, let's go back to when this statement was written, back before 1888, and apply it to the Seventh Avenue Church organization as it then was. And certainly back in those days there were different parties of Advent believers as well as of course the various Protestant churches who were enlarged, enlarged to embrace the Protestant churches. Now do we find in the Protestant churches truths in, uh, individually held by this church or another church which we can also find back then in the Seventh-day Adventist church? For instance, the Baptist church taught in baptism by immersion. Do we find that truth in the Seventh-day Adventist church? Back then, right. The Seventh-day Baptist taught both baptism and the Seventh-day Sabbath. Do we find both those truths in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Right. 
Some of them taught the second coming of Christ fairly accurately and we find that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Some of them uh, stressed the need to obey the law of God that we find in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Some teach that uh, you are saved by the grace of Christ and that alone which of course also found, was also found back in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In other words, every single truth found individually scattered through all these different organisations was collectively found in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But in addition back there the Adventist people had truths that none of the others knew nor did they understand. One such being, of course, the, the correct interpretation of 2,200 day prophecy, the true part of ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, the investigative judgment, the, um, the final atonement, the truth in the millennium. Those were truths which were held by none of the other churches round about. So that test back there definitely showed that the Seventh-day Adventist Church before 1888 was the Church of God. It was being prepared, or at least God was trying to prepare it for the great day of judgment, and this test therefore applies to them at that time. But today, the story is very different. And now we, we apply the test as it now stands at the present time. And we ask ourselves, as we look out at the various different Advent uh, groups, the, the big Seventh-day Adventist Church itself, Reformed Seventh-day Adventist Church, Grothier, Bauer, um, Santi and so forth and as you investigate each of these church organizations do you find that each of them has undeniable truth in them every one of them no exceptions but at the same time of course you find that each of them has error mixed up with those truths for instance Mike Clute teaches that God doesn't destroy but he goes too far and also teaches that uh, the sacrificial system is satanic and that it was Satan who told Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac. And that's an extreme position, so there's error mixed up with the truth. Now, when you collect by listing all the truths found in each of these different organizations and check the, message, the messages held by this movement, do you find that we lack nothing of the truths held individually by the others? Right, they're all here. But do you find that in addition to what they understand, we have truths that none of them know? Gospel. The gospel for starters, right? And that, that of course, is the, that is the all-important message. If the church which has the gospel of Jesus Christ is the church of Christ. And we have that gospel, both uh, by, by our realization, of course, it's scriptural, and secondly, by the effect it has upon our life experience. So we have the gospel. We are bondage to freedom, acceptable confession, and justified by faith, and those wonderful studies that make that point very, very clear and plain. Now, have you found or seen or heard of or witnessed to in any one of those churches the message of the seven angels? It's not there, is it? Have you found in any of those churches the Sabbath rest message as we hold it today? It's not there, is it? Have you found the message on God is my doctor as we teach it today and experience it? It's just not there in any of those church organisations. And uh, do we find a presentation such, such as we had last year on, uh, the, on the Philadelphian church, the, the principles of holiness, which is of course to obey and believe. Do we find that in any, any other churches? We don't, do we? And uh, even the character of God, even though it's taught by one or two individuals in the Adventist church and also uh, by Mike Clute, for instance, it's not taught as we teach it. It's not taught in its fullness and accuracy as we teach it. In fact, I'm told that when Graham Maxwell, who wrote the book, um, what's the title again? Uh, can, 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 pardon? Can God be trusted? Can God be trusted? Right, that's it. When someone gave him a copy of the book Behold You God, and he read that through, he pretended to be be terrible error. He just couldn't go along with it at all. So there's a very big difference between his message on God's character and the one which we support in this movement. So those, those principles make it absolutely plain then that uh, the one movement today which meets the specifications of this paragraph is this movement. And no other movement does, not one. I should mention too that uh, any movement which, um, well first of all, yes, any movement today which is a true continuation of God's truth must come out of a Seventh-day Adventist background. The same as the Apostolic Church had to come from a Jewish background and the, and the evidence from the Reformers and the Reformers from the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church from the Apostolic Church. In other words, from the days of Adam to the end of time, 
there is an unbroken sequence of uh, truth that, that passes from movement to movement and we don't find God taking a movement so far cutting it off entirely and going over here and making an absolutely fresh start there's always a remnant from the previous movement that goes on so therefore the true movement today cannot have a Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist or any other background except Seventh-day Adventist and while the Seventh-day Adventist Church rightfully and correctly went to every nation upon the face of the earth because the third angel had to do that this move, or the movement which, which follows on and takes up the torch the Seventh-day Adventist Church laid down must extend how far into the world to every nation, kindred, tongue and people because how much of the earth does the fourth angel lighten? All the earth now I think practically almost every movement in circulation today and, all, and, and many which have become non-existent by this time all were in the field before this movement was. I recall when I came to America back in 1964 I was quite amazed at the number of voices that were travelling around the country proclaiming they had the truth, they were the Church of God and they of course were in the field long before this movement was yet today most of them have completely disappeared off the face of the earth and those who have survived are still limited to uh, a very small geographical area in the world and the only movement of Seventh Avenue's background the only one which today is not on every continent on the face of the earth is this movement there are, there are no others no, no others at all this movement should be on every continent, continent and gaining an increasing foothold to and on those continents I mean Australia, Africa, Europe, Asia North America and South America I should mention not, uh, not in Antarctica we haven't, we haven't got to the penguins yet <laughs> but then there's no one living down there so we don't count that as being a continent to be entered by the gospel where? Asia, Asia we have folk in India and interest in Hong Kong and Taiwan and Japan so it's in Asia too We have an Asian. <coughs> we have an Asian in in Germany. Uh, his name is Mohammed, somebody, and he really loves this message very, very much too. He's now living in Europe, and he's not. He's not in his own country of Iran. Right now, coming back to this paragraph, there are certain conclusions Sister White draws now from the fact that uh, God does have a movement, and we just read that. Um, they are unable to understand these great truths and no doubt some of you have been frustrated by the experience of trying to present bondage to freedom to some of these church people they just simply can't see it you notice that? it's just sealed up to them they can't see what the Lord is saying now I read further things which are sealed up to them the Lord has opened to those who will see and are ready to, to understand now it goes on to say if God has any new light to communicate he will let his chosen and beloved understand it without their going to have their minds enlightened by hearing those who are in darkness and error. Now a concern which has been expressed by some people and a philosophy which has been therefore advanced by these same people is this that there is truth in all these different organizations and if we're going to get all the truth we'll have to wander around and sample it from each and every one of these different organizations. That's their concern and that's their conclusion but the word of God says that if God has well, the word of God says first of all that there is no truth in those organizations not already found amongst these true children who have been prepared for the day of God and furthermore that if God has any new light to communicate he will communicate it to his children not to these other wandering voices around the, the, around the land and um, therefore there's no need for us God says and God says it not me there's no need for us to go to have our minds enlightened by hearing those who are in darkness and error now the, the passage now becomes stronger when she says I was shown the necessity of those who believe that we are having the last message of mercy being separate from those who are daily imbibing new errors now you folk have uh, been in this movement for varying periods of time some longer than others of course some of you have been doing some furious catching up <laughs> 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 and remember the statement which says that uh, in these last days some will learn in the few short months which taken others of us years and years to learn 
and this is actually happening at the present time and I believe that you're all here because you are convinced that we are hearing at this time the last message of mercy in actual fact this is that message there's no question about that all the prophecies we looked at over the last couple of days indicate the loud cries of the next events in human history and we are well advanced into the tarrying time that we are actually in the in the last um, movements or movings toward the climax of all things and irrevocably the movement is going forward and we either keep up with it or we fall behind the march has begun and uh, it's essential that we gird up our loins and keep pace with the advancing light now Sister White says then or God said rather and Sister White reported what she was shown I was shown so it wasn't her opinion not that I believe any of her writings were I shall the necessity now what does necessity mean is it different from advisability much more much stronger isn't it something which, which is needful it's required and uh, if we don't do the course if we don't meet the necessity then we're going to find ourselves falling behind and losing out very badly I was shown the necessity of those who believe that we are having the last message of mercy the necessity of being severed from those who are daily imbibing new errors that's just why it says is necessary I saw that neither young nor old should attend their meetings for it is wrong to thus encourage them while they teach error which is a deadly poison to the soul and teach the doctrines and commandments of men the influence of such gatherings is not good if God has delivered us from such darkness and error we should stand fast in the liberty wherewith he has set us free and rejoice in the truth God is displeased with us when we go to listen to error without being obliged to go for unless he sends us to those meetings where error is forced home to the people by the power of the will he will not keep us the angels cease their watchful care over us and we are left to the buffetings of the enemy to be darkened and weakened by him and the power of his evil angels and the light around us becomes contaminated with the darkness now that's a rather serious warning isn't it one two five in the book now one two well one between one two three and one two five early writings okay now it is a fearful thing to incur God's displeasure not that um, we know of course that God's mood doesn't change because God does not change to incur God's displeasure of course is to place oneself where we lose his protection because, because we go where his protection doesn't extend and um, if we go to listen to error which you can't help but do if you go to the church today without being obliged to go now what does this mean by, by this obligation to go to listen to error pardon force well it could be uh, yes it could be forced but I'm more inclined to think that uh, because it goes on to say in the next sentence for unless he sends us to those meetings so the obligation comes from him doesn't it unless he sends us to those meetings now as you will remember and can testify to I have advocated of course over the years we don't rashly and impetuously run out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that we wait very we wait very carefully to receive a directive from God because sometimes there is, it is needful for us to spend a short time there to witness to those who are likewise in the valley of decision but uh, at the same time we should find ourselves yearning for the day of separation so as to escape from the evil influences of errors which are being forced home upon the conscience uh, again with the, by the power of the will so this obligation must be from heaven itself and separation must come at the point of time when God himself designates now take great care of course not, not to dally or tarry too long when the word comes to go be gone and mind you um, in as much as the generally held view in the Seventh day Adventist Church is that of the abomination of desolation and uh, when Jesus Christ said to his disciples when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place let him as Jerusalem run don't wait a moment don't go back to get your possessions get out as fast as you possibly can and while today there may be individual Adventists who do not believe in Christ coming in sinless flesh uh, the fact still remains that the Seventh Adventist Church's official worldwide position today is that Christ did come in sinless flesh and that is the abomination of desolation one form of it it stands today in the holy place which is the Seventh Adventist Church 
And what then is our obligation or advice from God? To flee, right? Flee for our lives without hesitation. There's a fact that uh, if we don't and if we remain in the church after we are obliged by God to leave and our witness there is complete, if we don't do it, the angels cease their watchful care over us and we are left to the buffetings of the enemy to be darkened and weakened by him and, and the power of his evil angels and the light around us becomes contaminated with the darkness. Now contamination, of course, is uh, a very, very evil thing. Now I want to recall a statement made in the book called The Midnight Cry by Francis D. Nicoll. And that's a, that's a remarkable book and it's well worth you possessing and reading it, at least the first half which deals with the actual history of 1844. And uh, I regard very highly my careful reading of the 1844 movements and Nichols' book is extremely well put together and well documented and very accurate, I believe, in tracing that history. And the observations made there that um, it was noticed in 1844 that those folk who accepted the 1844 message and uh, responded to the separation call and, and came out from the fallen churches of that time thrived in their spiritual experience and grew stronger and stronger. Whereas every one of those who dallied and said, well, we must stay here as a witness to our fellow believers and didn't respond to the call, found, uh, it was found that their experience weakened, they became confused and bewildered and very soon they lost the message altogether. As we're warned here, will likewise happen in our experience too. Now let me examine now an argument that people often advance in order to remain in the church at least for the time being. They say, look, if I separate from the church, I'll lose all contact with the church members. And you do, at least so it seems. And the result is going to be that I'll be out there all by myself. I'll be a burning coal which will grow dim because I have nothing else to, to inspire me and to fire me. And precious souls will lose their eternal life because I selfishly, selfishly looked after my own interests and left the church. Here I am nice and comfortable outside while all these folk are in there perishing for the one of my ministry. Now that of course is a nice little bit of plausible human reasoning which is not true in fact. What actually happens in fact is this that if you stay in the church then the people that you want to reach in there begin to reason at least subconsciously as follows. They say, well now here's this person, I know that he has some different ideas, but he's in the church and therefore that infers he believes this to be the one and only true church which is going to the kingdom. Now I'm on the same ship, he's, he's in this ship and so am I. But now he wants me or she wants me to embrace his peculiar beliefs but if I do, I'm going to find myself suffering as he or she is suffering. I will lose my post as a Sabbath school teacher. I won't be elected back to the office of elder. I won't be given the task of being missionary leader or Dorcas welfare worker or whatever else the case might be. And I don't want to, and, and furthermore I'll be uh, kind of uh, shut out somewhat, I'll be regarded coolly and uh, I'll, I'll have to sit there in dumb silence during the Sabbath school lessons and making my contribution. Now, he's going to the kingdom and having a rough passage because of what he believes. I'm going on the same ship to the same king kingdom, so why should I embrace his teaching and have the same rough passage when I have a smooth passage? And that, that's the kind of thinking which goes to their minds. And therefore, staying back in the church beyond God's, in, in, uh, be, beyond God's limitations of your staying there, which usually is very short, actually works against your purpose which is always the way with human planning anyway. Whenever you plan against God's counsels, you always find that what you think is wisdom is in fact confusion and, and works in the opposite direction for what you wish it would work. Whereas, of course, if you, if you have been, of course, if, you, if you've been in the church a difficult person, you know, one of those ornery, hard to get along with grumbling types that... Uh, that uh, are never very happy with anything and always complaining and looking for higher positions. Of course, we don't want you in this movement either. Because <laughs> you only make us trouble too. Right? But of course, we still, um, we don't shut it on anyone's face naturally. So it's hoped, of course, that you, back in the church you were a very respected, a deeply loved member of the church. 
and the folk recognised that you were earnest and sincere and you loved the message of truth and worked uh, to promote it. So when you leave the church, people will say, well now, if he or she left, there has to be a good reason. And this leads folk to ask questions and contacts are made which otherwise would not be possible. And we certainly found that uh, when the Brinsmeads argued back in 1962 that if we all left the church we'd lose our contact with the believers, that would be the end of our growth. And we said, no, on the contrary, it'll mean the beginning of our growth. Time has absolutely proved our argument to be true because ever since that day the church has been growing in numbers clear around the world. Now going a little further, on page 125 I find these words. I saw that we have no time to throw away in listening to fables. Our mind should not be thus diverted, but should be occupied with the present truth and seeking wisdom that we may obtain a more thorough knowledge of our position, that with meekness we may be able to give a reason of our hope from the scriptures. While false doctrines and dangerous errors are being pressed upon the mind, it cannot be dwelling upon the truth which is to fit and prepare the house of Israel to stand in the day of the Lord. Now time is one of the most precious talents God has given to us and one of the most irredeemable. Money, well you can store that and, and use it later but you can't store time. Time that you have today is for today alone and when it's gone, it's gone. I think um, especially in respect to the message on child salvation and the opportunity that comes to us parents when the child is as yet unborn is never recovered. Once, once the, once the mould has been placed upon that infant's mind by the influences around him, there's nothing later, uh, that, 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 that mould is there and nothing later can wholly remove it and certainly cannot put the mould we'd like to see there as it would have done had, had we done it when the child was very young. So time is a valuable, a priceless treasure, a talent which cannot be replaced. Once it's gone, it's gone and cannot be recovered. And uh, we don't have much time left, I'm quite sure of that, and you are too. We're moving right down to the close of human history and very soon we'll be thrown into the battle and then we'll recognise how ill-prepared we really are despite the work God has done for us during these years. And then we'll long to have come back to this point of time and made better uh, use of the time which is now available to us. You read, of course, how the apostles felt the same way after Pentecost when they realised how little they had advantaged themselves of the teachings of Christ before the crucifixion. So then, this little chapter makes it very, very, does several things for us. It tells us, tells us, uh, or gives to us a very clear means whereby we can identify what is the true Church of God today, or 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, as the case may be. It tells us that each of the professed uh, Advent believing groups have some truth but all these truths are given to God's true people and they lack nothing of present truth furthermore that God's true people have truths that none of the others know nor understand and to them any new light will be communicated therefore there's no need for us at all to go circulating around these different movements or reading their books in order to find out any little bits of truth which we might think we, we could miss in the real movement of God and then we're plainly told, of course, that God is very displeased with us if we go to these meetings without being obliged to go. And if we do go, we're solemnly warned the angels will cease their watchful care over us, which will leave us exposed to physical, mental and spiritual peril, a situation we can't very well afford to be in, especially Satan very, very uh, fiercely hates those who have at least been once in the truth. And we have no time to go and listen to those fables. Now I do trust that this portrayal, and I guess that uh, there are other details I could recall and go on talking for the next couple of days yet in regard to various incidents that have taken place in the movement. I will mention of course that uh, once the Brinsmead people went back to the church again and went their way in wee hours, we began to lose sight of them and today I have very little, very little information about what Bob is doing or where he is and very little interest as well. That's all past history now. And what he does today, of course, does not influence the work of God in any way whatsoever. And um, um, he's gone his way, we go ours, exactly as the prophecy, of course, indicated. Now, I do trust that uh, this portrayal of these great prophecies, I think we got through about seven altogether, have served to confirm us in the realization that history is, in fact, being made. Prophecy is being fulfilled. 
the word of God has come to us and God has said turn you and go back to your land again just as God said to Jacob and later to the children of Israel after their 40 years of wandering the movement is marching on and it is our business to keep pace with the advancing light so we shall not be found unprepared when the final crisis comes we can rejoice of course in the fact that the long dark wilderness wandering is over that we have come back to Kadesh Barnea for the second time that we have marched up very close to the Jordan River and interestingly enough um, just as, as Moses God's leader back there rehearsed the history of Israel just before the crossing of the Jordan River so we find ourselves being directed in this camp to do the same thing I wonder if, it's, if there's a great significance in that an indication that we really are that close to the crossing of the Jordan River uh, uh, the crossing which symbolizes our entry into the battle with the beast in his image because first before they really possessed the land they had to conquer the Babylon of that time the Philistines, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites and whatnot. and likewise when we cross the Jordan River we'll, we'll be committed then there'll be no turning back <coughs> the waters will roll deep and dark behind us there'll be no turning back, there's no bridge and um, then will commence in latter rain power the battle with the beast in his image the final victory and then comes the possession of the land and it could well be that that uh, struggle is very very close and I do trust that uh, the, the latter rain will fall soon and when it does we'll be ready for it so that more or less concludes this section of our camp study the, the survey of these prophecies and the history which is the fulfillment of them and uh, this afternoon I promised you there would be a question session already I have one page containing three or four questions so if you have any questions you'd like to ask write them out and drop them up here and I'll be glad to attempt an answer to them what I can't answer of course I'll admit now, any questions you'd like to ask on um, this uh, historical presentation yes Uh, Morrison. Well, he was the man who led out in uh, in uh, that was Charlie Morgan. He, he was the man who led out in trying to remove that system again. And in that meeting, I meant to mention in that meeting when um, we we uh, stood by the principle, we we came completely clean and voted the committee out of existence. We had to vote it out because that was our last vote. We voted it in, so we had to vote it out. <laughs> that was our last voting action. <laughs> <laughs>